Welcome everyone. I'm Kat Sheridan. We are here with the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery for an artist talk for Teresa Witt, one of our artists in the exhibition After Hours Artwork by State of Ohio Employees 2021. Um, today, Teresa is going to share with you her journey as an artist, the work that she's created, um, and how she's come to where she is. A little bit of housekeeping before we get uh, too far in. Uh, please remember that uh, you should remain on mute while Teresa is giving her talk. If you have questions, feel free to put them into um, the chat box or if you're on Facebook into the comments. We'll be sure to get to those at the very end. Um, and if you need live transcripts, we do have those available. If you'd like to turn them off, you also have that option. Um, right at the base of your Zoom window, there's something in a little box with a CC and you click on that and you can control what you see or don't see there. Um, but anyhow, I'm super excited to present to you Teresa Witt and without further ado, I'll let her share her story. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Teresa Mayers Witt. Um, I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, um, and um, I'm an employee of the state of Ohio. I work at Twin Valley Behavioral Health Care full time in the pharmacy department, and it's a great job. I've uh, worked there almost 12 years, um, and I really do like it a lot, but it's not very artistic. And sometimes you just need some kind of a, a an outlet for your artistic um, endeavors. And so I have found quilting to be that uh, outlet for me. And I'm not sure why this didn't, there we go. So when I was growing up, these are my parents, Charles and Mary Mayers. Um, my dad was an artist. He went to fine art school and he painted, he sculpted, and he was a storyteller. He made up stories and told us to told them to me and my siblings when we were little. Um, he painted, uh, he painted in oils and in acrylics. He was and he was very talented. He also sculpted with wire and with clay, and he did um, some plaster of Paris castings and later on did screen printing and sort of some other sorts of artwork but he always was making something beautiful when I was growing up. This is a picture of a fish that my dad made when I was a little girl. He probably did this, um, I'm going to date myself, probably um, maybe in the mid to late 60s um, and that has hung in my home, my parents home for my entire life. That is the famous fish and you can tell it's mid-century. Everything he had was orange and beautiful. Um, he was, he was a, a real uh, inspiration to me. However, I didn't think that I was artistic <clears throat> when I was growing up. I wanted to be, but I didn't think I was. Now my mom, I didn't think she was artistic at all. Uh, mom was a homemaker. She was, uh, she could cook, she could garden. And she taught me to sew when I was really little. I can remember standing in front of the sewing machine because I couldn't reach the pedal on the floor if I sat in the chair. So um, probably when I was in the, I might have been a high school graduate, but maybe not. Anyway, in the early 80s, my mother joined a little group at church and it was a quilting group. She had never quilted before. She had always sewn clothes and things for us, but um, she joined a, a group of ladies from the church. They all picked out their fabrics and every month they would get together. They would read a little bit of the Bible, have some coffee cake, and then they would exchange their quilt blocks. It was like a social thing that they did. Um, and she made, she made all of her blocks and she made the quilt and it was, and it was really lovely. The quilt that she had, had the signatures of all of her friends that made the blocks for her. And basically they made the blocks and she got them back in her own fabric. It was just, it was really pretty. And she still uses that quilt on her bed today. It's been on her quilt for all these years. Um, 
So the quilt in this photograph is a quilt that she made. And this is a really, really impressive quilt to anybody that's a quilter because this was all needle turn applique. She cut the pattern pieces with templates um, and then she applied them to a whole cloth background. It was a lot of work, all done by hand with a needle and thread. And then she quilted it by hand with a needle and thread. And although this picture isn't very clear and it's hard to see, this has an overall one and a half inch grid of, um, of squares all over the whole, the whole surface. It's just a tremendous, tremendous amount of work. And as her daughter, of course, I really admire this work, but you can see from the ribbons that are hanging on it, so do other people. It was just really an outstanding example of her, of her talent. So probably when <clears throat> my mom was in her late seventies, um, I was at her house visiting and she had always belonged to a quilting guild, the Common Threads Quilting Guild that was here in Bexley, Ohio. And uh, she had finished a quilt and I asked her what her guild mates thought of it. And she said, oh, I haven't been going to guild anymore because um, I don't like to drive that drive. It's after dark and I just am not comfortable doing it anymore. And she seemed disappointed and I, I was really surprised. And so I told her, mom, you know, I would love to help you out. I will take you to your guild meetings. Uh, it's just once a month on a Tuesday evening. And if, even if I have to leave work a little bit early to get you, I, I'd be happy to do that for you. And she said, you would? And I said, of course I would. I, I wish you would have asked me earlier. I, I would be happy to do that. She said, well, you'll have to join the guild and you're gonna have to make some quilts. And so I thought, okay, well, I guess I will have to make some quilts. So, this is a photograph of the first quilt I made in progress. I went down to her basement. I looked through all of her quilting magazines. I found a really, really easy pattern to make. Um, and then I went to Joanne Fabrics because I didn't want to spend a lot of money. I wanted to make something that was inexpensive and just try it out and see if I liked it. Um, little did I know where that, what the rabbit hole I was going down was going to turn out to be. Um, and I was thinking about this actual picture earlier. I had asked um, my sister-in-law, well, actually asked on Facebook what people thought of this block. And my sister-in-law's um, mother, Margaret, said, you need to turn around those, uh, those four patches so that the dark pink color is closest to the turquoise center. And I listened to that advice and I thought, I've already sewn these seams. I don't wanna redo it. So I just left it as is. And Margaret, if you're here, I don't know if you're listening or not, you were right, I was wrong. However, I finished the quilt and I was really, really thrilled to get it done. This is me on the right, me exhibiting the quilt at the Common Threads Quilt Guild, which I joined and I love. It's really been the most wonderful group. And on the left is a photograph of this quilt that I took on our porch last weekend, I think, or the weekend before last. Anyway, um, and it's, you know, it's several years old. It's been laundered a million times. We use it. It's soft and it's cozy. And I just, uh, I'm proud as punch of that quilt. Um, I was really, really not sure that I would ever really make it when I bought that fabric, but I'm really glad I did. So what is a quilt? A quilt is made of three layers, generally. It's a quilt top, which is where all the fancy piecework is, if you're doing fancy piecework. A backing, which is usually a solid piece of fabric, although it can also be pieced. And then something in the middle, it can be a piece of flannel. In the old days, it could have been just like an old wool blanket that was starting to be worn and unsightly. Um, or you could use batting, which is what most people use today. It's a, it's a product that's just like a roll of uh, fluff that's made into a mat. It can be made out of wool, cotton, bamboo, silk, all different materials that it can be made out of. Um, but that's what makes it a quilt, having the three layers put together. They can be hand stitched together, they can just be tied, or you could use a 
a sewing machine or a long arm sewing machine to put those layers together into a quilt. This is a recent top that I made. Uh, not very recent. This is probably a couple of years ago that I made this top. The, the um, asterisk blocks were intended to look like snowflakes. And this was a guild uh, swap where we all made these blue and white snowflake blocks and we exchanged them. So um, some of these were made by me and some were made by somebody else. And when I went to put them all together, I really didn't like the way that the quilt looked. I felt like it needed something else. So I made the alternate block, which are these double pinwheel blocks. I added um, a constant fabric that appears as the smaller windmill in each of the blocks. Um, and then each of these windmill uh, double windmill, or double, I'm sorry, excuse me, double pinwheel blocks has a different dark blue flat fabric um, as the outer blades. Um, I felt like when I put that together, it sort of broke up the asterisk blocks and I liked it a lot better. And the picture on the right is after I long arm quilted it, I took it outside to show to my husband and threw it up on the hood of the car <laughs> so you could see it. And it just turned out really pretty. This is an example of what's called scrap quilting. Um, I made this quilt um, out of actually other people's scraps. I hadn't been quilting very long. And I, uh, I, I came across a quilter named Bonnie Hunter. And this was what she calls her leader ender project. And it's kind of a quilt that you make in between other, other quilt blocks. So the, technique is just that you have a pile of little parts to a quilt that you have sitting there and you work on your main quilt and then you take a couple pieces for your leader ender project and you run those through the machine and so you're making two quilts at once. So I did not have scraps to use because I hadn't been quilting very long. Um, so I got a trash bag of scraps from somebody on Facebook or Craigslist or somewhere. I bought it like from somebody that was local and I split those scraps with my sister and they all ended up in here. And you can see that there's John Deere fabric, there's Superman fabric, pink leopard print, all kinds of crazy things in this quilt, candy bars. Um, and I love this. I feel like this is just this riot of different um, colors and different themes and all of it is just I just love the way that it looks because it's got such small pieces it's got extra weight to it it's just a, a really really wonderful quilt in my opinion I just I love this one this is another quilt top this is made in civil war fabrics and we exchanged in the in the guild this was another exchange we exchanged these little star blocks so I had a pile of, I think, 15, 12 or 15 of the star blocks, and I decided that I wanted to make a queen size quilt out of it. So I made more of the stars, and then I used the solid blocks in between. And I used a really pretty busy um, sashing fabric that uh, dark, um, it's sort of like a rust colored sashing. Um, to put it together. I, I was really concerned when I picked it out that maybe it would look too busy or make the quilt look too busy, but I think that with the large squares of solids in it that it doesn't look too busy, and I was really pleased with this top finish. So this quilt, this quilt, I was visiting my mother and my Aunt Kathy, who at the time was over 80, said, I brought a quilt with me. Well, Aunt Kathy, I never even knew, knew how to operate a sewing machine. She had never done a, any sewing that I was aware of. Um, and so she brought out this quilt top that was together and she had started to quilt it and the backing had bunched all up and the batting was torn. Um, and she's like, I just don't know what to do. I got to this point and now I just don't even like it anymore because it's, you know, it's been so much work and I've ruined it. And I said, well, let me take it. I'll take it home and I'll, and I'll long arm it for you. It'll be nice. So this is a picture of the quilt in the process of me taking it all back apart to get that 
tangle of threads off of it. So I had to pretty much disassemble the whole thing. The thing I love about this quilt um, is that it took me a long time in my quilting to realize that there was benefit to low contrast and no contrast. And my aunt Kathy, who was over 80 years old and had never made a quilt before, had the artistic vision to make blocks that included her background fabric in them. So it just gives it some really nice visual interest in these places where instead of having two fabrics to make her nine patch blocks. She just used one fabric in her background. And she she did that in several blocks on this quilt. And I just think it is so really, really interesting that she was able to see that and do it. And this is a picture of the cultures in my family. On the left is my mom. To her, next to her is my Aunt Kathy. Um, and she, this is the day that I actually gave her the quilt after it was completed and she was really happy with it. And then there's me and my sister, Mary, who we'll talk about later. So another guild project that we do is annually, they have some kind of a um, challenge quilt that they ask us to participate in. And so they give you a theme. And so the theme, for this particular year was Sunbonnet Sue goes to Hollywood. I think this was the brainchild of my friend Katie. Um, and oh gosh, it was a hoot to make this thing. So what you had to do, the premise was that you were going to make this little doll, Sunbonnet Sue. She's a very, she's a classic quilt pattern and put her in an iconic television or movie role. So um, I decided that the best use of Sunbonnet Sue and that would be to put her in um, the Pride Rock scene where Rafiki is holding up Simba at Pride Rock. So um, these are just some assembly pictures of me uh, figuring out how to do it. I took a coloring book page and sort of drew out what was on that picture and made patterns for all of the different elements in the quilt. Um, I got it all put together in the middle photo um, and decided that it needed some uh, animals and other sort of uh, desert animal scenes or I don't know, grassland animals, I guess is what they are. So on the left is the actual completed quilt and on the right is it on display at the guild reveal for the challenge. And I was really, happy with the way it turned out and other people liked it too because I won the challenge. So these are little tiny nine patch blocks of all different fabrics um, and I this quilt top I made um, after I had gotten a whole bunch of the little nine patch blocks and I had to figure out how to put them together so I did a double nine patch, which is uh, taking, making, making nine little squares. Five of them are the, have the nine patch blocks and four of them are plain background fabric and putting them together in this layout with alternate blank blocks. Um, I found a pattern similar on line that I liked. Uh, the only difference is I decided to add on the edges, these little half blocks that had uh, three of the nine patches on them so that my diamonds would continue all the way to the edge of the quilt. So um, this was like my first try at actually figuring out a layout on my own that was uh, not, a, not a pattern per se, but just a, a good layout for um, quilt blocks that I had made. And actually some of these were exchange blocks. We did like a nine, a nine patch block exchange. Those are little blocks. They're only three inches. So um, in April, a couple of years ago, my dad passed away and I was uh, having a really hard time dealing with that. He had been sick for a, a, a really long time and I couldn't process it. And I got a phone call from my dear friend, my best friend, of a lifetime, Leanne. And she told me that she, uh, a family friend of hers, 
um, was sick with a recurrence of uh, leukemia. Um, he was young, he was like, I think 21, young, very young man. And um, so she asked me if I would be willing to put together a quilt for him. So we picked out fabrics, with beautiful um, green and blue ocean colored batik fabrics for this project. And then we sent muslin squares to everyone he knew. They had like several different times where they met and had people decorate the squares and put the put the squares together. So we rushed and we got this quilt done in record time. Um, and it turned out beautifully. Um, Leanne helped me stitch it together. And this is the finished quilt that we made for Drew. Unfortunately, um, he didn't get to see it. He passed away before we had it done, but it was at the funeral home with him and now his parents, um, I believe his mother and his sister have this quilt um, at home with them. And I hope it gives them as much comfort as it gave me therapy that I needed to deal with uh, losing my dad at that time. It was um, really a labor of love to get to do this and such a, such a real blessing to me to be able to make that. Okay, so this is a quilt that I started making for my son and I haven't finished. Sorry, Coleman, I love you. I'm sorry I haven't finished her quilt. Um, this is called a trip around the world quilt and um, I used a line of fabric by Tim Holt. They're all like measuring tapes, cigar boxes, and yard sticks, old art. They're just really, it's called eclectic elements and they're just really interesting uh, boy fabric. So, um, I teamed that up with some solids and some florals. Um, and uh, in making this quilt, I learned that my blocks had to have a really solid and strong diagonal line going through them. You can see that this is actually, this top is really actually sewn together in the pictures it's not, but it's sewn together exactly like it's laid out. Um, and you can see on the corners in the edges, there are some that I made that did not have that strong line. And so I put them off to the edge so that you wouldn't notice and it wouldn't mess up the pattern. But um, this is, it's called a trip around the world. And it was really fun to put those blocks together. So I won a bundle of <laughs> Halloween fabric. I am not a big Halloween person. <laughs> I mean, I like Halloween, but it's not usually my thing. Um, so my sister uh, actually suggested this pattern to me. And <clears throat> so I got the pattern and I made all these blocks and I had such a ball doing this one. Um, I, uh, I made the, all the blocks that the pattern called for and I, um, I decided that it needed something. So I added these, I designed and added the little candy corn blocks very hard. They're almost exactly the same as the hat, but that was my first time that I ever made a block, a quilt block that was a block that I designed. I, I figured out how to make that and make it turn out the right size and look the right shape to be candy corn. So I made chocolate candy corns and regular candy corns. And I really think that they added a lot to the quilt top. Um, the picture on the right, you can see that this is right after I finished doing the long arm quilting on it's laying across the quilting frame in my quilting studio. And um, it just shows a little bit of the texture that I got with the, um, the quilting on that piece. And the left picture is just the top sewn together and the right picture is um, the completed quilt um, with its little candy cane striped orange and black and green uh, binding on there that I thought just was the perfect binding for that quilt. So I've talked a little bit about long arm quilting. This is actually <clears throat> my machine that I use. This was a, a Christmas gift from my husband. Um, we were looking for a sewing machine for me to use um, for quilting. And he, you know, he said, I think that since you're doing this, you really probably should get a new machine. And I told him, I said, you know, I like the sewing machines that I have. I have some old uh, Singer sewing machines from the 50s. I don't really 
need a new machine, but I would like to have something I could do the quilting on easier. So I started looking for uh, just a machine with a bigger throat space that I could use. And he said, well, will that be all you, you want? And I said, well, someday I want a long arm machine. And he said, let's just skip the middle, middle machine. And he bought, bought me this one for Christmas. And it has been really wonderful to have the ability to quilt my quilts myself on my own time when I want to. And in the picture is a, uh, this is a, it's called the Pleiades um, quilt. It was a, uh, quilt along several years ago of just star uh, star blocks and um, that I did it in two versions one was just like bright solids and I did this in more traditional fabrics um, for a bedspread this is an early quilt that I made this is called a hunter star and I used a technique called paper piecing where you print the block onto a piece of paper and then you sew the fabric to the paper it's it, it's very complicated to explain how it works but in practice what it does is it helps you to make really accurate uh, designs so that everything fits together perfectly when you do it um, this, I just love this Hunter's Star pattern. It's arrows, as you can see, there's an arrow in each block and then where the corners come together, it creates these stars. Um, and also in this, I wanna point out that I had a line of fabric that I used to make this. Um, I can't remember the designer's name. Anyway, I, uh, I loved her fabric and I put it all together and then I, had this black batik fabric and I just I can't stick to the rules I added that black batik fabric in there and I thought maybe I shouldn't have done that but it's just me it's just I like that just putting things together myself and I don't I'm not real matchy matchy and I'm not I just like that I have something in there that doesn't really belong but it kind of belongs This is the quilt that I made for my granddaughter. And it was a really early quilt that I did. And um, and she has used it, boy, she's used it a lot. I saw it when I was over there and it's, it, it's really not even the same colors anymore. Um, but I wanted to talk about the quilting on it. Um, it was an easy to piece pattern. It was real simple to make. Um, and then when I quilted it, um, I snuck her name in on the quilting. And so you can see that in the uh, window here that I typed her or put her script name in the stitching. And that was something that she could find after she got the quilt and she found it and she was really happy that her name was on it. Um, and in this, these two images, I wanted to point out that this is the quilting on that same quilt. On the left image, you can see that I was using a, what's called a pantograph pattern with the long arm where you sort of follow a, a, a pattern that's printed on paper with a laser light and that helps you to guide the sewing machine um, back and forth across the quilt. And you can see in the left photo that I was doing a really kind of cruddy job of staying on the lines. I've got curves. My little, uh, my little uh, feather tips are very crooked in some spots. But then on the right, same area of the quilt, I changed the angle of the camera and you can see the beautiful texture. And really that's what the goal is when you're quilting is to have beautiful texture and those errors or mistakes or whoops, I've gone off the line places don't really matter in the big picture of it. It's got quilting on it. It's going to stay together when it's laundered. It will still be all in one piece when it comes out. And that's the whole goal of the quilt. Although it's nice to make it beautiful if you can. <laughs> this is just another example of me practicing quilting. Um, I had uh, decided that I needed to make some baby quilts. Well, conveniently, my cousin's daughter was having a baby, her second, and her daughter was going to become a big sister. So I made this big sister quilt for Scarlett and I went crazy with the quilting on it. Um, you can see I used flannel fabric and so the quilting really stands out um, and you can see all the different crazy quilting patterns that I tried to do on this quilt. Um, 
and it was really great practice. I learned to do some straight lines and to do curves and uh, I really enjoyed making it. I also made a quilt for her baby brother, Brooks. And this is actually the back on the left-hand side is the back of the quilt that I made for Brooks. Same idea with his, I did um, just a ton of different uh, patterns. I also had leftover fabric from the front that I decided, oh, I'll just make some racing stripes on the back. That'll look cute. And so um, the picture on the right is the two quilts together with the labels, um, one of them saying, you're a big sister, and the other one saying, welcome to the world, to the new baby. So this is where we talk about my sister, Mary. My sister, Mary, is a fantastic seamstress. She made my wedding dress. She made my sister's wedding dress. She made clothes for herself and for us when we were growing up. Um, she just is really, really talented with fabric and stitching. So when my mother made her very first quilt that I told you about earlier, the friendship quilt, my sister Mary was living in Buffalo, New York at the time. Um, so she went and bought some fabric and tried her hand at quilting. Um, this is before we had all the modern conveniences we have of specialty rulers, uh, of um, uh, uh, rotary cutting and so forth. And she used templates and scissors and created uh, really interesting and intricate blocks um, using the old techniques. So she put together this quilt top back in the 80s probably, or probably mid 80s and then she put it in a box she didn't quilt it she didn't know what to do with it so she put it in a box and she didn't she moved it from place to place she's probably lived in a dozen <laughs> maybe not a dozen at least a half dozen different houses that this place this thing followed her from place to place it was just in a box so when I started quilting and I realized that I really loved it I told Mary you would really love this too you really should try quilting and she said, well, I can't do it because I've got a quilt top that I made back in the 80s and I've been carrying it around in a box with me all this time and I've never finished it. So until I finish that quilt, I am not going to, I'm not going to learn to quilt. And so I nagged her and I nagged her and she just was not budging from that position. So um, when I got my long arm, I was afraid to quilt on somebody else's quilt. So I asked her, can I please use that quilt top? I don't want to ruin something that I have, have, you know, big feelings for. And you've been sitting on this thing for 30 something years. Can I just borrow it and quilt it? And she said, sure, she would let me quilt it. So I quilted it to death. I, I quilted and quilted and quilted. These lines are a quarter of an inch apart on some of these blocks, but I was learning and I had a real fun time doing it. The picture on the right is a picture of me and my sister showing the 30-year quilt at the Quilting Guild meeting for Common, Common Threads Quilt Guild. Um, and after this quilt was finished, she agreed that she was going to start making some quilts. And I'm so glad she did because she's really talented and she's been my partner in crime. I love her so much. So then the pandemic happened. This quilt is a quilt by GE Designs. Um, her name is Gudrun Erla. And she, um, I actually made this, this is her pattern, I'm sorry. I made this quilt, um, but it's her pattern. Uh, back in, I can't remember, it was like April or May of, of 2020, um, she announced that she was going to do a quarantine quilt along. And so she designed this quilt and the pattern is called, Oh, I think, <laughs> well, now I'm nervous and I can't remember the name of the pattern. I think it's hope. Anyway, um, so I was, I decided I was going to go ahead and do this quarantine quilt along. And basically you made, made a donation, um, for the quilt pattern and, uh, you, and she, once you got the pattern, you selected your fabrics and then over a weekend, she would come online at certain times, you know, pre-scheduled times of the day and give you tips on making these blocks to make this quilt. Well, at some point I read, was reading what fabrics I needed and I 
got over one and I ended up making enough blocks for a king size quilt, which is kind of funny because I don't have a king size bed. And I was making blocks and I'm like, why do I have so many blocks? This just seems like I'm never going to get done. Well, it's because I made the most, the biggest quantity of blocks that you could make. And then I put it together as a king size quilt. I figure somebody is going to get this quilt as a gift from me because um, I think it turned out great, but it was a really good way to spend a weekend in quarantine, something to do and something to feel united with other people. This quilt I made recently, and if any of the Chris Mayer's family are online, this is Zoe's quilt and it is complete. I just need to get it to you. This is for my niece, Zoe. She, um, She's the baby of the grandkids. And uh, mom made quilts for all of the other grandchildren, um, except for Michelle. She made one instead for Michelle's son, Aiden. But um, she made quilts for all of the grandchildren. And uh, by the time Zoe came along, she just wasn't able anymore. Uh, mom's got some. Um, a little bit of dementia and she just can't seem to focus on making a quilt anymore. So um, I invited her over. She helped me make some of the blocks. And then I put together this quilt for Zoe and I was so pleased with the way it turned out. And I wanna point out those little one inch squares all around the outside edge of the quilt. This is something I will never do again. <laughs> it was beautiful. I love the way that it turned out but those were the most fiddly things I've ever made. They were a real pain, but they turned out great. I think they look really good. And the last quilt I'm gonna share uh, before we get to the part of my exhibit is this is a quilt that I made for my husband. Um, I made it with a panel with really simple patchwork. Um, and he will always tell you that this is the best quilt I ever made. And um, and I'm glad that he appreciates it. He's a real motorcycle lover and the motorcycles are great because he spends a lot of mo money on his motorcycle stuff and it makes it really easy for me to spend a lot of money on fabric and not feel guilty. Um, and this is why he thinks it's the best one I ever did. I quilted this. Um, I really put a lot of time into the patterns that I quilted into this big panel. Um, I marked it with painter's tape and stitch the lines, um, the horizontal lines. And then in between the horizontal lines, I used a different fill on each row. Um, and I think it turned out really, really good. And it's more of sort of a display piece. So it, it doesn't get, uh, it's not, it doesn't have to be soft. So putting a lot of quilting on it was fine. So now we're gonna get to the quilts that I made for the exhibit. Um, and I, I am exhibiting three different quilts. Um, this is the oldest of the three. Um, when I decided that I wanted to try to submit some quilts, I decided to make one quilt from scratch, but then I was encouraged to go ahead and, um, and submit three different quilts because, um, just to, you know, to have a better chance of having something actually get into the exhibit. So this is the first one that I did. This is a chunky churn dash pattern. And it's, um, this is a free pattern on Bonnie Hunter's uh, website to make the blocks. So I, um, I participated, it was at the very beginning of my quilting career. Um, I, uh, I participated in a swap where we made these, uh, chunky churn dash blocks out of 1930s reproduction prints. So the fun thing about 1930s reproductions is they have the funniest, cutest little things on them. So if you look on the left hand photograph um, on the bottom in the bottom chunky churn dash, that's all pigs. And then in the center one on the red fabric is Scotty dogs. Um, and then on the right one, also on, like on the left margin, there's a different pig pattern. So they always have cute little animals and things on them. And they're really bright, um, but they give you sort of a feeling of um, softness um, and they feel springy to me. I just really love the 30s uh, reproductions. So this on this quilt, I did hand guided custom quilting. I uh, 
picked out a design that I liked um, and I, I fine tuned it and, to decide how exactly I was gonna quilt all these blocks. Um, I want you to notice that I did, in addition to the chunky churn dash blocks, which are these ones like the pink one here, um, I made hourglass blocks that were made out of two white triangles and a gold and a green. And by turning that block in different directions, I gave the illusion that the chunky churn dash blocks were great big blocks set on point. And by using three colors in those blocks, it gave me white diamonds and green diamonds and yellow diamonds. So shout out to Lori Nisley, my coworker, who helped me to fine tune this. I probably asked her 200 times, what do you think of this? Do you think I should stitch this on it? Or do you think I should do this? This might be too hard. She was wonderful. And she helped me decide what I wanted to do. Um, and it was easy to quilt out. And I think it turned out really nice. So this is a picture of that quilt when it was first done hanging over our fence and on a chair on my porch. And this is a picture of it hanging in the gallery. Um, this quilt is the quilt when you come to my house, if you are cold, I pull it out and let you cover up with it. When my kids are sick and they come to my house, they cover up with this quilt. When I'm not feeling well, this is what I watch. When we're snuggling in front of the television, this is the one that we pull out and use. This is our convalescence quilt. This is our comfort quilt. And it's the one that really, really is used all the time. And in this photograph, you can really see um, how beautifully soft those colors look when you step back and look at them from a distance. So the next quilt I did also, this is a, another Bonnie Hunter. I know her name keeps coming up. She's brilliant. Um, she's a scrap quilter and I just really love her, her work. So this quilt is part of her winter mystery that she does every year. Um, and what a mystery quilt is, is that uh, she gives you some guidelines on what kind of fabric colors to choose and what, uh, what fabric uh, what fabrics she chose to do the quilt, but you don't get to see what you're making until you're done, till the very last, the very last instruction weeks later, it usually comes around New Year's and you start on Black Friday with the sewing. So um, these, the first uh, step in this mystery quilt was to make red and neutral four patches. Now I chose to make this quilt out of a sort of non-traditional um, fabric by using all batik fabrics. These are hand dyed um, fabrics and they all have like really interesting patterns on them. So they're, they, they aren't flat looking. Um, interestingly enough, I, uh, I can't figure out what a neutral is. I used gray, I used tan, I used cream and I like them all together in this quilt. So the picture on the left is the first finished block that she had us make. Um, and I want you to notice that on those orange bands, those are um, strip pieced. And so I just like put together uh, many different orange fabrics and sewed them together, slightly wonky, however they came together, all different widths to make those orange sections. On the right is a picture of the back of the block because I think it's important to see that while all the beauty is up front, part of the, uh, the real skill involves getting all of that stuff on the back to lay flat. And so you can see all of the seams in there and they're all pressed in the right direction. So everything nests together and from the front it's calm and on the back you can see all the chaos. These are also, um, this is just some of the other fabrics that I use. This is a different block that we had to make for that same quilt and they turned out to be this. So I used um, a variety of blues and greens um, all the way from like a turquoise, turquoisey looking greens to like really grass greens in this quilt. And um, when you looked at all the fabrics laid out together, I, I think that uh, even I thought, and I wonder if I'm just doing too much, um, too much variety. These are my neutral strips, again, showing a lot of different varieties of fabrics that I put together to make the sashings and the edges. 
this is where I really went away from what her pattern was. The pattern was uh, for a completely different outer border using orange and blue, or maybe it was red and green. I can't remember, it was different colors than what I chose. And I changed the layout so that I could make this beautiful ribbon uh, border for it. And I like I wanted to bring out the red and the blue in the quilt, so I felt like um, this was a good option. Um, and although it's it's in the same spirit of what she was doing, I feel like it made this quilt my own. Um, and I used a pantograph on this one. I just it was like a really simple um, pantograph pattern from um, it's called China Seas, and I just thought since the name of she named this quilt good fortune because based on a trip she had to china um i thought oh china seas that's really <laughs> that's perfect um so again you can see the beautiful texture that you get when you put that quilting in and it's not not critical that everything be perfect also i want to point out in this um that if you look at the quilting pattern every single piece of fabric that's on here I tried to cross with stitching it's really important to match the scale of your quilting with the size of the blocks that you're making you want to have stitching on every block because when you pull on the quilt and when it's in the washing machine and it's being agitated you don't want those seams to pop open they're really a pain in the neck to repair and if you go on each make sure that you have some stitching on each and every block the backing and the batting stabilize that front so the seams won't pull apart. This is a picture of the top. On the right is a picture of the top on my back porch in the snow. I think my son was outside holding that up for me and cursing me for making him go outside. And on the left is a picture of the quilt hanging in the gallery. So the quilt that I got the most questions about by far was the one block wonder that I made. And I made it specifically for this exhibit. I had tried to make a one block wonder quilt in the past using this fabric. And I loved the way some of these blocks turned out. So let me describe the technique to you, although it's a little bit technical, but basically fabric is printed in a pattern, they'll use the same 24 inches and they just repeat it down the, the length of the fabric. So when you buy fabric, you can find a flower here and then 24 inches down the way, you'll find it again here. So what you do is you have to have six exact repeats of that pattern in order to make a one block wonder quilt. You cut off six exact sections of the fabric and then you line up the pattern so it's one on top of each other um, and it's really important that everything's perfectly lined up then you cut it into strips and you cut those strips into 60 degree triangles i know it's really complicated and hard to understand hard to picture what i'm saying but basically with your six triangles you end up being able to arrange them to make the same uh it gives you the idea of what a kaleidoscope does with the mirrors and the beads inside of a kaleidoscope. So um, by having those exact repeats of fabric, you can make some really beautiful patterns. And so these are some examples of the blocks that I made. I've never finished this quilt. I still have the blocks and I am going to someday finish it. Although I'm not, this was not a good fabric choice. And the reason I think it was a poor choice is because it's too busy. When you put them all together, it's just, I couldn't find a layout where everything looked cohesive. It just was too much, too many colors, too much. And maybe I'll like it better when it's sewn together. But right now I think it's not, wasn't a good choice. I was not happy with that. Although the colors are really pretty. I, and this is where I was trying to figure out, well, can I tone it down with another, with a background? fabric. And I do think that this aqua might look really pretty with it if I get it finished. 
So here's a tool that we use. This is another fabric that I have bought that I am going to, I just recently bought this to make a one block wonder quilt out of. And um, in the pictures to the right are, I have a little mirror set up. It's a tool that you can buy in quilting shops that helps you to envision what your blocks could look like if you do one block wonders. And so you just set up this little triangle of mirrors on different areas of your quilt and see what it might look like if you make a kaleidoscope block out of it. So I think that this fabric is a much better choice for a one block wonder because it's got a lot of color, but it's got a lot of background. So that background really gives you some um, blocks that will have, have a little bit of the color on them, but that have, uh, just have something that sort of unifies. Um, also, I was worried about the center of the Christmas tree not, you know, being too busy and not having much black on it. But when I lay the um, the mirrors on it and looked, I thought, okay, it still will look good. They won't be too much because the bulbs are different than the than the greenery. So I think that this is going to be a much better choice. This is the fabric that I did the one block wonder that I have in the exhibit from. Um, and it was in the middle of the pandemic and most of the fabric stores were closed, uh, but Joann's was open. I don't know why they didn't close for the pandemic, but they did not. So I went to Joann's. I was really nervous about going to the store. I masked up and I made sure I stayed away from everybody. And I went through the fabric and I found this piece of fabric and there was enough of it. I thought, cause you know, it takes quite a bit of fabric to make a one block wonder. You're only buying one fabric for the whole quilt top. So I chose this one and I brought it home and I thought, well, gosh, I hope it works. That maybe I, you know, I really second guessed myself. So then I started making, I cut it up and I started making my hexagons. And um, these are the first eight I made. And I was thrilled. I thought, oh my gosh, they're really, really pretty. And not only do you get, when you make these kaleidoscope blocks, you get things that look like the upper left-hand one, which looks like a giant chrysanthemum to me, or you get ones that are on the bottom right that are completely something different, but they turn out looking like a little flower with spinning petals around it. It's just was wonderful. And you get the different wreath shapes too. So it's just, I was really, really happy with the way they looked. So these are some pictures of in process, making this quilt and laying them out. I have a piece of batting hanging on the wall in the hallway um, that I use for my uh, design wall. And I was laying the blocks up there. So I put them all in order of what I thought was going to be from lightest to darkest. And uh, then I took a black and white photo and you can see how um, I utterly failed at doing that. When you look at the value of the blocks that I have hanging up here, Sure, I did get some of the dark ones at the top and some of the light ones at the bottom, but somehow in color to the naked eye, some of those blocks really did look light even though they were dark. So that's a really good tool to use when you're trying to determine value of fabric is to get out your cell phone, take a black and white image, and then you can compare the fabrics and see whether your eyes are telling you the truth or if they're lying to you. So when I got the top all put together or the center of the top all put together, I was so excited that I ran outside and I threw it down in the driveway and my neighbors and my husband came out and looked at it and they were all like, oh, wow, that's really a beautiful quilt top. I was, they all seemed like very happy with the way it turned out as was I. Um, so that was probably about five minutes after I put the last seam in the top, I was down in the driveway with it thrown out on the concrete looking at it. The, the image on the left is again, uh, an image to illustrate how much stitching goes into this quilt. You can see really plainly, you can see the uh, grid work of diamonds on the back of it for making it. But if you look closely, there are also um, vertical lines on there. There are also other seams. So I carefully pressed open all of the seams when I was making the rows. But then when I, um, when I, put the rows together, I, I just pressed them all to one side, but it's just like a ton of seams. It was quite a bit of work to get those all together. 
And so the left image is just a close up of some of the blocks that I made. And then the right image is the completed quilt. Um, I, my quilting that I did on this quilt, uh, I did these lines that are all on the outer section, all different uh, widths apart. And I didn't wanna to draw too much attention to that black. I just wanted to add some texture. And um, the best way to avoid having a mistake in the width apart, the distance apart of your stitching is to intentionally make them not equidistant. So I just sort of put them on there um, in a way that felt good to me. And I thought that it, it gave some interest to the outer edge. And this is a, a closer uh, image of that. And it shows that I put this little tiny light, uh, bright blue flange on the binding for this, just to make a little outline around the outside of the quilt. I just thought it needed a little tiny bit of something that wasn't didn't yell too loud, but was there. Um, and in the right hand picture, you can see the quilting that I did on the actual hexagons. I just did like sort of a flower shape that went out to the into each of the pieces of fabric just to hold it all together. You can barely see it from the front of the quilt. It's really just more functional. Um, and it was a simple pattern that I thought was kind of cute. And the left picture is a picture of the quilt hanging in the gallery. And the right picture is my favorite over the patio furniture image. So that's the quilts that I have in the exhibit. Um, what am I doing now? I am, these are some blocks that my friend Leanne found, I think either at a thrift store or at an antique mall, they were all in a bag. And, you know, I mentioned my chunky churn dash quilt is made out of 1930s reproduction fabrics. This is made out of 1930s fabrics. These are really old blocks. The muslin on them is thin, kind of a little bit stained, but I'm just ignoring that part. And they're all hand stitched. Somebody made 172 of these guys. Um, they're about four inches and they stuffed them in a bag. And so uh, Leanne found them and brought them to me and said, would you like to have these? <laughs> of course I said, yes. So my plan with these guys is I'm going to make them into a small quilt that is gonna be for display only. I they seem pretty sturdy, but the, the workmanship is so fine. And I figured that they have survived since probably the 1930s or 40s. So they are probably 80 or 90 years old and I would hate for them to come to their death at my house. So I'm gonna just put them into something and then, and then love and cherish them because I think that they're just awesome. And for any quilters out there that are watching this, Note that these aren't the cheater bow ties where you, where you snowball the corners of your neutral blocks. These are hand pieced and the centers are all a solid square that she has fitted everything together in there. They're, they're really very, very fine work. I'm also working on these cows blocks. They're so much fun. This is an Amy Friend block of the month pattern. Um, she gives you, it's, it's paper piecing. So you build the blocks on pieces of paper um, and she gives you the, the patterns and you can do whatever you want. And I'm having a ball with these. I'm way behind, but I'm putting little people and dogs and plants and things in the windows and just having all kinds of fun with the whimsy of putting bike, bikes in the front yard and uh, flowers in the sky. I just am loving making these guys. And then this is my most recent thing that I'm working on. I uh, took a online class from a Emily Taylor. She's the collage quilter. And this is a technique that I've been wanting to learn to do because I would like to do some collaging of actual photographs of things that are different. I purchased her pattern to make this uh, this example. And as you can see, um, it's behind me in the room. It's still not quite finished, um, but I'm still working on the background and I, then I need to quilt it. But uh, I wanted to learn the technique of how to select fabrics, how to work on um, the, the color selections like she did to make, to be able to give it some uh, dimension and make it look real. I'm, I'm really 
thrilled with the way that the trunk turned out. I know it's like five little pieces of fabric, but I really wanted it to look like the top of the tree was making a shadow on the trunk of the tree. And I think it worked. So I'm just having a, a real ball with doing this collaging technique. And, uh, and it's all made out of, out of fabrics. Um, and it's just, it's really fun. So that's it. I have Instagram. I appreciate everybody tuning in to watch this. It's really heartwarming to uh, know that there were a bunch of people that were interested in what I have to say. Um, follow me on Instagram at, at TIWIT. I, uh, it's a lot of quilting stuff and it's some family stuff, some vacation stuff, but there's, I usually post some of my quilts. So I would love it if you would do so. Thanks everyone. That was lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa. I, I think that everyone really, um, if they're anything like me, really enjoyed the, the story of, of the work and how you've come to the place that you are as an artist through, um, you know, happenstance and, and grabbing on to these opportunities that present, oh, that's an opportunity. Sure, I'll do that and presents itself and you go forward and build upon that. Um, but Let's open it up to the floor. Are there any questions for Teresa? Does anyone have any questions that they wanna put, put out to the group? Um, if you're not sure how to type in the chat, if you just raise your hand, I'm sure that we can uh, get you here and, and unmute you if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, don't be shy. I know there's a bunch of family in there that is not shy. And we'll look for you on Facebook as well. I think you must have covered everything, Teresa. I guess so. I know it probably went long. I don't have any idea what time it is, but. Oh, oh, Rachel, Rachel would like to know which one is your favorite. Oh, I, I can't, it's just like, I can't tell you you're my favorite kid, Rachel. I can't tell you which is my favorite quilt. I love so many of them. Oh my gosh, I'm looking to see who's here. And I'm seeing that there are some, some of my quilting friends are here. I just saw Jackie come in and I just want to say Jackie taught me that you can never have too much orange in your quilts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Um, um, do you have your favorite? Have you figured it out? Are you going to tell us? You know, I think of the quilts that I had in the gallery, my favorite is the Good Fortune. The one that's made out of the batiks with the bright colors. That really feels like the one that's the most like me. Um, I love the way that one Black Wonder turned out, but it's, um, it's for this display. And the thing is, is that my quilts, I really want them to be um, something that, I want them to be functional not just something that you look at that's beautiful. I mean, I love doing that. I mean, I love doing things like this back here. That, that making something uh, that's purely for a wall hanging, I love doing it. However, I want something that somebody's gonna put around them and it's gonna keep them warm. And when they have it around them, they're gonna feel the love that I put into making it for them. So, so I really, the good fortune, I really, really, truly love. I love the chunky churn dash. And of the quilts that I showed, <clears throat> boy, I, I'm really having fun making those houses. I think that's going to be a really fun one when it's done. Speaking of, Kayla mentioned as a comment, I can tell I'm going to love the houses quilt because it reminds me of miniature doll houses. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's fine. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, we have, <laughs> uh, we have a uh, note from Drew saying, I have a question. When is our cuddle up quilt coming? Oh, well, I'm working on it. I have got some, thanks Drew, calling me out. Um, I have got your quilt in the process. Uh, it kind of got moved a little bit down the line. I have several quilts that I Oh, people that I really do have to work on. Um, and, and I am going to get it, no uh, no get, get it taken care of for you, honey. They're, I they're promise. Just, you know, encouraging you. 
um, from uh, someone I, whose name was obscured. Fantastic presentation. I enjoy you sharing your work with me at Twin Valley. And then from another person, they're all beautiful. Um, and from Drew, we love you. Take your time. <laughs> I love the presentation. I have a comment from Christina Benedetti who said, I love the way that your talk highlighted your individual creativity and the ways that quilting is often collaborative, piecing or quilting other people's work, doing creative things with fabric that other people designed, etc. I'd love to hear your thoughts about both collaboration and individual expression. Thank you. You know, that's been uh, very inspiring to me. Um, some of my favorite projects have been the bow tie blocks that I'm actually working on currently and working on the project for my Aunt Kathy. Those are um, those are projects that were started by other people and that I'm I'm finishing. Um, it, it's fun to take something that somebody else has designed and, and then put your own stamp on it. Um, and that's traditionally what quilting has always been. You know, it's there's a lot of traditional blocks that you can use to make quilts. Um, and, uh, you know, we, one of the things that we do at the Guild is we'll all work together on like a, a quilting project that, um, a pattern that we all work on together. In fact, sitting back here, I can't, probably can't see it very well, but, behind me is a quilt that was designed by the president of my quilting guild, um, one of the co-presidents. Her name is Carla Zadnik, and that quilt is called Girls Just Want to Have Fun, and she designed it during the Me Too movement and, um, and presented it to the guild and said, hey, anyone that wants to participate can make this quilt. Uh, it's, it was so much fun to make it. And so I think that probably at least maybe 15 or more people in the guild decided to go ahead and make one. And when you see those quilts, none of them look alike. <laughs> Everyone has taken that pattern and just really um, expressed their own taste and their own, uh, 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 their own spirit into that quilt. It's just, they're lovely and they, they were so much fun to do. And I just love seeing um, all the differences. And Rachel's commenting about that. This She has said over and over again that this is her favorite quilt that I've made. So I know that she loves that one, so. Kat, you're muted. It is helpful if I'm unmuted. Um, <laughs> Something I, th I think that that's a great kind of segue into kind of wrapping us up. There's something that I noticed that you said early on, which is, you know, you admired your your father's artistry and then your discovery of your mother's artistry and that you never saw that for yourself, but you wanted it. Something that I find uh, so comforting and extraordinary about fiber art and quilting specifically is that it's a doorway for folks that don't um, necessarily feel uh, that the pen to paper or pencil to paper is their route. Like the, because fabric is so um, ubiquitous, we, we all wear it, we all sleep on it. Um, there's something so common and understood that there's no barrier to it. So to pick up fabric and piece it together and make more things that then come around and, and comfort us. It just makes so much sense hearing your talk that uh, that would be your entry point to your artistry and unlocking your creativity. So uh, congrats on, on finding that pathway. We've all been able to be inspired by that. Um, and so I'd also say as a piece of this exhibition, After Hours is really about the fact that these folks are all full-time employees of the state and also are phenomenal artists in times that are not, you know, at, at work. So unleash that creativity that we all have within ourselves. Um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal to get to see within this exhibition. And I want to thank you again, Teresa, for presenting this evening and, and bringing a, a nice big crowd with you. Um, 
and thank you to the governor's office and the Ohio legislature, which supports the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery, which in turn allows us to amplify artists' voices. Um, I hope you all had a great evening with us. Have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.